Alright, so we have Spain finally populating Texas. We've got missionaries here. We have a couple uh, missions in San Antonio. This is going to be the prime settlement in Texas. Again, uh, the five missions right along the San Antonio River. And then we have a handful of people up here in Los Cedes, capital of Texas, although it's not even officially in what's today Texas. It's in Louisiana. Um, but not many people in the missions there. Again, very few caddos want to attend these missions. So it's just a presidio up here, a handful of missionaries, maybe occasionally a handful of caddos, but usually uh, very few in the mission. And then again, there are actually coal techans in the mission in San Antonio. So this is a sizable settlement. And then we have a presidio right here, San Juan Batista. Again, also El Paso over here, but we're focusing on the east uh, right now. Well, you have couple missionaries, a couple Presidio soldiers, and a couple uh, Indians that are slowly becoming Hispanicized. Well, the Spanish want Texas to grow. And Texas isn't really going to grow if you just have a couple missionary soldiers and mission Indians. And if it is going to grow, it's going to require a lot of money because basically it requires money for, for missions to operate, takes money to purchase the uh, gifts to give the Indians. Sure, the Indians will... Um, grow food for the missionaries but missionaries need you know uh, stuff for sustenance soldiers you obviously have to pay them as well Spain you know doesn't want to keep this up for the foreseeable future it would like to you know the Texas to be self-sufficient so what the Spanish are going to try to do beginning around 1720 or so is they're going to try to provide incentives uh, for people to move to Texas and so how can we do this? Well, they don't want to give out money because, hey, we're already paying soldiers and missionaries. That's um, uh, We're giving out money uh, already, so we don't want to give out even more. So what we'll see Spanish officials start doing is offering one thing that Texas has in abundance. That is going to be land. So got a lot of land. You come here to Texas. We're going to uh, parcel it up, and you will have a huge you know, uh, you know, X amount of acres of land. Uh, which you might not be able to have in any other place in the Spanish Empire. A handful of civilians will take the Spanish up on this offer. We're going to see 1720 to about 1730 or so, really maybe about a dozen families are going to come around here and claim some of this land right around San Antonio. They'll start working with the uh, missionaries, mission Indians, and soldiers around San Antonio. They'll also, by the way, offer soldiers who retire from um, the Presidio in San Antonio and Los Cedes. Hey, if you want to just stay around here, here's a chunk of land as a retirement gift. So you will see some civilians come from retired soldiers. And as we mentioned, um, Mission Indians, after a while, they become Hispanicized. And there are a couple ways for Mission Indians or Hispanicized Indians, second generation, third generation uh, Hispanicized Indians to acquire land. But we need more than that. We need a rapid population growth for this Texas to become profitable and self-sustaining. So what Spain will begin doing in the 1720s, especially picking up in 1730, is they're going to start this propaganda campaign. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but this big advertising campaign. That'd probably be the best way to put it in Spain. So what they'll start doing is passing out leaflets to people you know, throughout Spain, hey, if you uh, can make your way over to Texas, we will give you a ton of free land. Now, a lot of this gets to Spain. Most people in Spain are one of, belong to one of two groups. They're the wealthy. They're the aristocrats, the people with close connections to the king. Most of those people already have land. And the idea of moving out to this place where, you know, you hear about these hostile Apaches attacking people, um, you hear about word of, um, you know, there's nobody else up here. To a very wealthy person with everything they need already in Spain, there's not any point in coming out here to this hostile uh, area. Well, um, the Spanish will decide to concentrate their advertising efforts on place that's already kind of a colony of Spain. These Canary Islands in the 1400s uh, had started to be populated by Spain. Essentially, there was an indigenous population here, essentially driven to extinction. And you had these uh, Spaniards from 1400s up until the 1700s settled in these Canary Islands. And the population, the Spanish population of the Canary Islands by 
1700 or so had grown significantly to the point where there's not a, a lot of available land on the Canary Islands. But the Canary Islanders, being remote from, from Europe, at least somewhat remote, um, are a industrious people. They're used to living under harsh conditions. So uh, 1730, Spain is going to start uh, putting out pamphlets, things like that in the Canary Islands. Hey, I know land's not very much uh, available here. But if you come out to this place, Texas, then uh, you can get a huge chunk of land for you and your family. And a number of Canary Islanders not wanting or wanting land. Uh, a lot of them actually are unaware of the you know patchy situation in Texas. But a number of them will accept this offer. And in 1731, we're going to see 55 Canary Islanders leave the Canary Islands. Um, Spain will basically say, "You get over here. We're going to offer you land." They're going to transport, come all the way to Veracruz again. If you're coming up here, the only um, port that Spain has in all of this area is Veracruz. So they're going to come through Veracruz, and they're going to start making their way up to San Antonio. So uh, along this journey, a handful of the Canary Islands will die. Uh, one man dies. He's bringing his family. His wife will uh, take over the land title that Spain had promised them when they get here. And the Canary Islanders are going to arrive in San Antonio again later in 1731. Well, they're going to arrive into this very closed community. Again, San Antonio, five missions. There's the uh, single presidio. And when they get there, they have, you know, Spanish government saying, Here, here's a bunch of land. You take what you need. But when they get there, they're going to find that all the best land, the stuff that's near the rivers, the stuff that you know has access to water, which is the stuff they're going to need if they want to grow crops and, and raise livestock, has already been claimed by the missionaries. So these five missionaries, they have Indians that are growing their food. They have Indians that um, uh, the Indians have already put them to work on these acequias, these aqueducts, which are going to bring in water to the crops. And so they already have the best access to water. So almost immediately, we're going to see these Canary Islanders start feuding with both soldiers and missionaries because, hey, we need to grow crops as well. Can you please allow us to use your aqueducts to water our fields? Well, missionaries will say, no, we need that for mission Indians to grow food for themselves and for us. So, no, you cannot have this uh, water. That's going to be a big dispute. We'll see legal issues arise over that. Another issue uh, that's going to arise between the Canary Islanders and the missionaries is concerning Indians themselves. So the way missionaries are used to operating is they have the mission Indians, they instruct them in uh, religious matters, teach them Spanish, things like that. But they don't pay the Indians. Basically, they expect the Indians to go work out in these fields and give the missionaries a portion of the food that they uh, grow in the fields. Well, um, these Canary Islanders are going to show up they're going to claim their land. They're going to want, you know, laborers to help them raise cattle, help them grow crops. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go to a lot of these mission Indians and they'll say, hey, if you come over here uh, to my plot of land, I'll pay you X amount of pieces of silver, gold, whatever, if you come work over here. So you have this mission Indian who can use his extra time to grow crops for the missionary or he can use his extra time to make a couple pieces of silver maybe you know buy some goods that he would like like a you know, nice pot or some nice clothing or something like that a lot of times they're going to go over to these uh, Canary Islanders start working for them well missionaries are going to start complaining to government officials hey these Indians are supposed to be working for us and there's going to be a lot of legal disputes based on that Canary Islanders are going to claim well, these are free people. By the way, you know some of these uh, Indians have already become fully Hispanicized. Why not let them work for themselves? So that's going to be a big issue. Um, and again, you get to second generation. Within, uh, you know, missionaries have been here around San Antonio for over 10 years. Some of these kids are coming of age that have been entirely raised in the missions. Speak Spanish perfectly. You know, uh, the Canary Islanders want to hire them as laborers. Can the missionaries keep them working for them when they're already Hispanicized? So that's going to be a big issue. There's also issues between soldiers, missionaries, and Canary Islanders concerning cattle. So a lot of these soldiers will be supplied by 
government in Mexico City or the Spanish government in Spain. They'll send them uh, firearms. They'll send them the food they need. But soldiers are also expected to sustain themselves. So they either do this by buying food from uh, so the civilians, like the Canary Islanders or the handful of other civilians who came from New Spain, or maybe buying from missionaries, or maybe raising food themselves. And as a matter of fact, what soldiers would often do is just purchase corn, beans, squash from uh, either the missionaries or the Canary Islanders, but they would raise cattle themselves. Well, big issue is going to come up because a lot of these uh, uh, cattle, who the heck do they belong to? Well, sometimes missionary cattle will get into Canary Islander uh, or other civilians cattle air ranging areas they don't have barbed wire back then putting up long wooden fence posts over long distances is very expensive and time-consuming so you could always have these disputes over ownership of cattle and we're gonna talk more about cattle in a little bit but that's gonna uh, create legal issues in the first years after these Canary Islanders arrive things are just gonna be uh, chaotic and, and missionaries will be fighting uh, Canary Islanders, Canary Islanders soldiers fighting, soldiers fighting missionaries, not physically fighting but legally fighting, arguing in courts, things like that. Well what will begin to happen and something we're going to talk more about in a little bit is that this these disputes are going to quickly be set aside and in part they're going to be set aside because all three of these groups are going to face attacks by Apache. So the Apaches are going to constantly come in. They're not going to distinguish between Canary Islanders cattle, missionaries cattle, soldiers cattle. They'll start attacking. And so what all three of these groups are going to quickly learn is that we need to stick together. We might not like each other, but we, uh, we like each other better than we like the Apaches. So it's almost the harshness of the frontier. And you add to that the fact that this is an area that's not very well supplied what this is going to do is create this unique identity for the people of Texas particularly the uh, San Antonio so quickly we'll start seeing a lot of these differences set aside but as we're going to be talking about a lot of differences will still carry over into future generations for example the uh, Canary Islanders because they came in they received a lot of land even though they didn't get the best watered land but because they had so much land uh, this is going to allow them to continue to make money over generations and uh, you will see throughout the 1700s and well into the 1800s Canary Islanders are going to serve as this almost elite class simply because they receive so much land as a promise from Spain if they came over from the Canary Islands so with this addition of these Canary Islanders with the Mission Indians um, uh, you know uh, natural childbirth and then soldiers retiring around San Antonio. You're going to see the population of San Antonio continue to grow by about 1735 or so. It's over 500 people. So we have San Antonio uh, is growing. As we mentioned, we have um, uh, we have Los Ades, a couple soldiers there, a handful of missionaries, not very many mission Indians. Well, we're going to see Texas grow even further in 1726 when there is going to be a new mission set up and we're not going to talk much about this mission simply because it's not going to grow at the same pace San Antonio is and it will actually change locations at at one point but in 1726 some missionaries see the success of San Antonio they're going to get in their minds to create this fort or create this mission at La Bahia among the Kronkwas well the uh, missionaries they come down here to the Kronkwas because the Karankawas had developed this hostile attitude towards Europeans, when the missionaries set up the La Bahia mission, very few Karankawas will attend. Some do, but owing to the fact that the Texas code is, is extremely hot and humid, the Karankawas that do attend, a number of them are going to quickly die. Uh, mosquitoes, you know, uh, pass diseases really quick along the coast. So those Kronkwas that do attend either they're gonna die or they're gonna run off when seeing the uh, their neighbors die so almost immediately the La Bahia mission will start failing they'll actually move the location of it um, uh, initially it's at the place where LaSalle's fort had been uh, but then you know uh, no mission no Indians are coming in they move it a couple miles down to uh, uh, you know find a better location a higher elevation where there's less disease but even after moving still not, not a lot of people there 
So uh, we do have a mission here, but again, not a lot of people. The only people really in Texas in um, uh, uh, 1730, 1740 are, are right about San Antonio. There are not a lot of people also down here just south of Texas. So you see down here, it's a sort of plains area. There's not a lot of gold, silver in this area. This today, Tamaulipas, uh, just south of Texas, a little bit of this area. It's today, Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Well, we're going to see that change beginning in the 1740s with this guy, Jose Escandon. Okay, Jose Escandon. Uh, Jose Escandon is just a private individual. He's a person that is, you can almost think of him as a real estate agent, a guy who wants to turn a profit and wants to sell land that's previously been unused. So you can imagine if you're a real estate agent today, you see a plot of land, it's woods, but it's on a really um, you know populated highway, and you think, man, you know, this would be a great place for a gas station or you know you see a place in a city that's you know abandoned building be great to have a nightclub here we all know what real estate developers are like well think of Jose Escondona as a real estate developer he sees this location just south of Texas right along today the Rio Grande and he says there's nobody here no Spaniards here at least uh, there are a couple of uh, Chichimeca, Cobaltec and Indian groups down here um, but missionaries haven't come amongst them yet, so there's just this land down here with a handful of Indians and no Spanish settlers, but Spain claims this as its own, and again, now we have populations up here. What are we going to do down here? Well, Escondón is going to petition the crown um, for permission to settle this area. Basically, uh, he goes to the king and queen and says, can I settle people there? Spanish crown wanting to better connect Texas to the rest of New Spain. Again, we have to buffer from the French and we can better do that if we can get supplies up here quicker. Me realizes that populating this area will better support Texas so they are going to give Escondón permission to sell these areas. Um, well what Escondón will do is he's actually going to offer cash incentives to people from New Spain that will settle in this region. Doesn't sound like a way to make money but way he's thinking is that if we can get the initial group up there, we can have some settlements, then the land is going to become more valuable, and um, uh, and, and then once it, this land becomes valuable, then you know I can sell additional land. So Escondón will start offering people to move up here to this area, um, and he's also going to encourage missionaries to move to this region. But Escondón realizing that if you have missionaries, civilian settlers moving into an area, there'd be disputes over, like we saw here in San Antonio just now with the Canary Islanders uh, and the missionaries over Indian labor. So what Escondón will say is, all right, hey missionaries, come over here. There's plenty of these smaller groups, these hunter-gatherer groups that would love Christianity. You can come here, establish missions, and we'll encourage them to at attend these missions, but we want you to pay for their labor. So if they're growing food for you, then you have to pay them. And we're not we're not going to do this except payment in terms of Jesus. You know, you can teach them Jesus, you can teach them all that, but you also have to provide them money for food, things like that. So Jose Escondón will uh, make this offer, and what we'll see is a number of settlements established here in northern Mexico, what's today Tamaulipas. Important for us is Laredo uh, will be established. It'll be one of the metal, many settlements established by Jose Escondón. And it's not just Laredo, but Jose Escondón will actually make a deal with the missionaries at La Bahia. He's going to say, if you will basically allow me to have some of your mission lanes around here, the crown, I've given the missionaries a bunch of land here. If you'll give me some of this land, I will encourage civilian settlers to move up here around La Bahia. And the missionaries, realizing they don't have many Indians coming in, needing support of civilian settlers, will um, uh, will allow Jose Escondón to start selling this land. So we also see civilian settlers moving up here around La Bahia. And uh, again, the population is going to grow there. Also, uh, Presidio will be set up near La Bahia as well. So by 1750, or, or shortly after 1750, Laredo settled in 1755. Most of it's going to be on the southern side of the Rio Grande, or the western side, I guess you would say. 
but there will be some settlements or some uh, uh, ranches and some civilians on the eastern side of the Rio Grande. But by 1755, these are the major settlements of Texas, okay? Uh, 1750 or so, population 1,500 to 2,000. So we have a couple censuses, but they, they vary uh, pretty wildly from one another. But 1,500 to 2,000 people. About 500 here in San Antonio, a uh, couple hundred here in Los Ades. Um I'm sorry, 1,000 in San Antonio, 1,000 in San Antonio, a couple hundred here in Los Ades. Maybe by 1755, maybe 500 in La Bahia. Uh, and then, even though as we're about to talk about, this isn't officially part of Texas at the time, you, you're going to have a couple hundred between San Juan Batista and Laredo. And then you have a couple people, 100 people over here in El Paso. So Texas is starting to grow. So now as it starts to grow, the question is going to come up, how do we govern this place? Actually, before we get there, this is the uh, roads to Texas around 1750. Some of these will be established afterwards, but no, there's a two main roads. You're going to have the Laredo Road, which is going to go uh, to La Bahia in this map. La Bahia today is Goliad. Uh, but back then it's called La Bahia. And then this is going to uh, connect up here to this road that's going to go from Nacogdoches, uh, which hasn't been established yet, but uh, all the way out here to what uh, Los Ades. And then you're going to have this San Juan Batista Road, basically, which is going to go th this direction. And these roads are connected to this Royal Road, which is, is going to go all the way down to Mexico City and then off to Veracruz. When I say roads, don't think of these roads as paved roads. And they're not even really, in a lot of places, um, dirt road, because a lot of times these roads will just turn to mud when you get a lot of rain, particularly out here in, in uh, East Texas. Since there's not a lot of people in Los Ades, this particular part of these roads will not be very well traveled. So somebody going out here to Los Ades uh, is going to have to um, go through certain spots where, you know, you're going to have to pull carts through almost woods, complete woods, because the, it's more of a trail, I guess, than a roads at certain points. All right, so we got this area uh, far up here. How do we govern this thing? How do we, the Spain, make sure that uh, this area is going to be properly protected from French expansion? How do we make sure our civilians are getting killed left and right? How do we make sure that, um, uh, how do we make sure that you know, Texas grows. What do we do? How do we how do we run things? Well, the way that Spain is going to set up the system is going to be something. It's going to be a huge, complicated bureaucracy. So, I want you to think about this as starting with the king. Okay, Spain's a monarchy. After the fall of the Roman Empire, you had all these tiny Christian kingdoms where people claimed, I have the right to rule others because God divinely ordained me to do so. Spain came together under a single king and queen. Those guys are at the very top. The king of Spain, top here, we've talked about you know that a couple different times. That guy is at the top. But that guy cannot rule over this huge empire here in the Americas. And then Spain also has the Philippines out there. They've also got some possessions in North Africa. So how are we going to rule over these areas? The crown or the king, he doesn't know what the heck's going on in Texas. How are we going to run things? Well, the way Spain is going to set its system up is the king will have right-hand men, might be the right way to put it, might have... Uh, you know, uh, people in the colonies that know the issues of the colonies better than the king possibly could. So what Spain will end up doing is dividing up its empire, and we're just showing its American empire here, into different vice royalties, okay? And these vice royalties will be under viceroys or vice kings. If you ever, if you know Spanish, vare is the uh, Spanish translation. That essentially means vice king. So rey is uh, means king, vice rey. So second hand king. So these vice rey, vice roys, be in charge of these large swaths of areas. So. You don't need to know the rest of these, but you have one over what's essentially today Colombia, one essentially over what's today Peru and Chile, and then you have this one that's over what's today Argentina, Paraguay, and Bolivia. 
one we're concerned about is this vice royalty of New Spain and this is going to extend all the way up to basically everywhere that Spain knows exists and actually this maps from a little bit later this when Spain owns Louisiana so ignore this part right here but this is uh, from all the way up here so New Mexico Texas all the way down here to uh, what's today Panama will be under a single viceroy so somebody like this who's a friend of the king the king trusts to uh, to run things in in the colonies well this is a lot of space and not a lot of people are living up here again in the late uh, or the mid 1700s so viceroys a lot of their attention is going to be focused down here and where the people live where all of the silver is coming from down here they don't pay a lot of attention up here simply because it's not as important to them and there these viceroys are going to be located in Mexico City that's going to be the capital of the viceroy vice royalty of New Spain so we need somebody to help me out in running this thing so the further breakdown of the Spanish government will will be to create provinces and this has been going on since you know uh, this first colonization of um, the Americas Columbus as a matter of fact was the first governor of Hispaniola but the way that these governors would work is you would have the viceroy appoint governors to these various provinces and they're going to be doing the viceroy's work and again the viceroy is doing the king's work and they would help run, run matters on a local basis so you're the viceroy down here you need somebody to make sure all the silver is extracted in Zacatecas, things are running properly, the king's getting his share of the silver. You, you know, the previous government dies, you appoint your buddy Bob Bobson. Hey, Bob Bobson, you're my go to man in Zacatecas. So he's going to be there to make sure all the silver gets out of the mines. And he's going to also make sure that you know, people aren't dying, you know, crime, it's, crimes aren't being committed. If he needs to hire people to, patrol the streets to arrest people whatever um, these uh, governors they're also going to be responsible for overseeing judicial matters so if there's something like a dispute between husband and wife that will go to the governor a lot of times governors appoint their own judges but for the most part you know they could just oversee criminal matters somebody gets accused of stealing from somebody else governors in charge of that Governor is also in charge of um, things like, um, again, uh, collecting uh, taxes from the people. So, uh, Viceroy appointed Governor of Texas. He's going to make sure that uh, you know uh, th these various taxes are collected. Uh, actually, Texas, for most of its existence, is going to be tax exempt because they want to encourage people to go up there. But for most other provinces, you have these taxes where people have to pay a portion of what they create to the um, viceroy and then the viceroy sends a portion of that back to the king so governors are going to be responsible for that governors are also going to be responsible for local missionary matters so uh, missionaries make sure the missions are being run properly uh, if there's a dispute between missionaries and soldiers or missionaries and civilian settlers the governor would uh, uh, settle them governors are going to be responsible for military matters so Presidios. He's got to occasionally uh, uh, check these presidios, make sure they're running properly, make sure if there's an Indian attack or whatever that the soldiers are responding to it. So in charge of military matters. So think of them as the local leaders for these provinces. And then again, the viceroy will be in charge of uh, this bigger, larger area of New Spain. So all this means is this um, huge complicated bureaucracy and this is going to be something that Spain's no known for because this can sometimes get extremely extremely complicated okay so the crowns at the top of this you've got this don't you, you guys don't have to worry about this but uh, this council of the Indies basically this is going to be the guy that this group that you know deals with in uh, matters in the Americas you, you don't have to worry about that group though the crown to the viceroy then the viceroy is in charge of the governor and um, then the governors are in charge of, uh, I guess this would be the local soldiers. Um, this right here would be city councils. So the one other thing you'll see in these provinces is each little city would have a group of local leaders. These are usually elites. They're going to be elected to 
um, a, a local city council and this is going to be to handle day-to-day -day op operations things like that that the governors probably can't get to things like setting up public schools like imagine you live in a town like San Antonio uh, a lot of kids don't know how to read and write well maybe the city council some of the elites get together set up a local tax to set, establish a school or maybe there's a problem with a road between San Antonio and La Bahia maybe these local leaders form a cabildo or an a call uh, would be the mayor uh, and they would discuss ways to build a road maybe we can raise local taxes for that okay um, these Indian governors you don't have to worry about that much in Texas but uh, uh, these uh, these cabildos are going to uh, be these local city leaders now there is this is going to sort of create a big problem uh, because a lot of these governors especially in governors in, in places that are very remote there's not a lot of checks on their power so the viceroy will appoint the governor of Texas and a lot of times the governors of Texas because it's so remote nobody wants the job okay if you're away from the civilian population you're up here where it's hard to get goods you know Texas isn't a money maker for Spain they're actually losing money down here you're making a lot of silver you're not gonna get a high quality individual uh, to want to do uh, go up to Texas what a lot of times the governors of Texas would be the third born son of some individual that did a favor for Spain a long time ago and you know a powerful elite he's got an incompetent third son he's from a very you know a family that the king owes uh, some favors to this family so hey my son needs a, a high paying job well throw him out here in Texas you know the, this he'll look good on a resume because it says he's a governor but again it's not the best province so uh, you get these governors out here because it's so remote a lot of these governors are going to end up being corrupt they're going to uh, take bribes uh, they'll a lot of times you know because the viceroy can't watch them very closely from a thousand miles away in Mexico City uh, they'll mistreat locals there are going to be some checks on governor's powers all the way out here you'll have local missionaries can appeal to bishops um, and these bishops have the ear of the Pope and then the Pope can say something to the king and the king usually a lot of times it, it local matters aren't going to get back to the king but if the local bishop is upset enough and the Pope gets involved maybe the crown gets involved maybe they can put a check on the governor um, other times you'll have local city leaders they wouldn't do this very often but let's imagine people of San Antonio are learning that the governor's collecting a tax on them they don't like uh, and also he's skimming off the top they could then appeal to the viceroy directly viceroy a lot of times is going to ignore, ignore these things you know you guys need to go through the chain of command but sometimes if matters get bad enough they will appeal to them uh, other times you'll have local military leaders maybe the governor of Texas is not properly giving the soldiers uh, money so the viceroy would send them money to pay the soldiers in presidios well maybe the presidio commanders will report to a general here in Mexico City he this then brings his attention to the viceroy the viceroy investigates the governor and finds out there's corruption so all this is to say is that there's a lot of bureaucracy here in um, New Spain and there's going to be a lot of bureaucracy within Texas itself and there's going to be a lot of corruption but there is some ways to put checks on this corruption okay alright well, what we're going to pick up on next time is how people live day-to-day -day lives here in Texas that brings up one final point about Spanish Texas so Spanish Texas was not Texas as we define it today today's Texas as we define it today is going to be something that was put together by um, Americans coming to Texas and essentially they are going to argue that Texas is way bigger than it had ever been under Spain and Mexico simply because they want to acquire more land they want to create a buffer with Mexico uh, during the Texas Revolution we'll talk about that later the way Spain defined Texas was they defined it as this area uh, right up here so up here the Red River um, all the way out to Los Ades again part of it was in Louisiana as we understand it today uh, and then down here to about this Nueces River right there this includes San Antonio, La Bahia, Los Ades but some of the areas we've been talking about are actually going to be a part of previous claims and other provinces in Texas so 
than Texas. So El Paso was actually considered part of New Mexico because it's right up here on this road to these New Mexican settlements. So it kind of made sense. This is how we get to New Mexico. Um, so uh, it, it would consider it part of New Mexico because of that. And then Cohila is going to be, same one, Batista is actually going to be a part of Cohila. This place had been settled since the late 1500s. Somebody had put a, a previous uh, demarcation on Cohila all the way north up here. And then when they created San Juan Batista, it went under the jurisdiction of the governor of Cohila. So he's going to be making the decisions for the soldiers at San Juan Batista. Laredo, because it's part of uh, Escondón settlements, it's going to be a part of this uh, Nuevo Santander. Okay. This is basically almost all of Escondón settlements, and so that's going to be Laredo. The only places that the governor of Texas is going to preside over are going to be San Antonio, La Bahia, Los Ades. And again, this area, this general area that's um, uh, a lot smaller than what we think of Texas uh, today.